Happy Monday, everyone. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch, Case Cracked. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend, and thank you so much for joining me here today. Today's mystery I like to call Injustice for Catrisa. You might know this story as the tale of the Dixmore Five. Dixmore is a village of just over one square mile and approximately 3,500 people. It's about 18 miles south of Chicago in Cook County, Illinois. In the late 80s, Dixmore was a mix of working class families and people struggling from a faltering local economy. The village's motto is faith and restoration, which both the village and several particular residents would desperately need to find and hold on to. 1991, 14-year-old Catrisa Matthews was an eighth grader at Rosa Parks Middle School. She enjoyed fashion, design, and singing in the school choir. She also enjoyed swimming and math, and even spoke to her mother about becoming an accountant someday. She would often stop by her grandmother's house after school, just as she did on November 19th. She left around 3.30 p.m. and was heading straight home, but unfortunately, she would never make it there. Catrisa was missing. Her mother, Teresa Matthews, searched abandoned buildings, businesses, and alleys. She got friends and family together to distribute flyers. Catrice's father, Mark Smith, had previously moved away to Florida to get away from some of the bad elements he was tied up in back in Illinois. They had even talked about Catrice possibly coming to live with him at some point in the future, but when he was contacted about her disappearance, he had no idea where she was. He also didn't believe that she would have run away when she already had another place to go. Where was Catrice? On December 8th, the body of Catrice was found in a field near an interstate, Interstate 57, by a man walking by. She had been sexually assaulted and killed by a single gunshot wound. Three hairs were found on her leg and those were collected as well as a rape kit being processed. Analysis showed that the DNA was from a male, but in 1991, there was no easy way to match that DNA to the culprit. Her father still struggles with guilt and remorse. In an interview, he stated, I think if I would have been there for her, she'd still be alive today. The case would go unsolved for almost a year, but then investigators seemed to get the break they were looking for. A tip comes in from Kino Barnes, who told police that he heard from a friend, Jonathan Barr, that he saw Catrice on the day she disappeared, and she was getting into a car with several other young boys. When interviewed, Jonathan Barr told police he knew two of the boys in the car, Robert Taylor and Robert Lee Veal. Robert Lee Veal was then picked up by police, and after five hours of being interviewed, signed a confession. He also told police that four others were involved, Robert Taylor, James Harden, Cheyenne Sharp, and the boy that spotted them in the car, Jonathan Barr. They all ranged in age from 14 to 16 years old at the time of the crime and would become known as the Dixmore Five. Police would wind up with three of them confessing and implicating all five. However, their confessions were not taped their parents were not present, despite them all being under 18 years of age, and they had no legal representation. One of the boys that confessed is reported to be developmentally disabled with an IQ of 56. On 60 Minutes, James Harden says he was told by police if he would sign the confession, he would be released immediately and he could go home and sleep in his own bed that night. The men would be tried as adults. The trial moved swiftly, despite a few shortcomings on the physical evidence. The hairs that were found don't match the young men, and maybe more importantly, neither does the DNA. However, they are all found guilty. Some of the men received 80 years in prison, with two of them getting much shorter sentences for testifying against the others. Soon after they started their sentences, James and Jonathan began writing letters to attorneys and universities looking for help. They were soon receiving numerous responses, including one from Tara Thompson at the University of Chicago's Exoneration Project. She reviewed the information and found that the numerous confessions were not factually lining up. She continued communicating with James and filed a petition for further DNA testing. 
More attorneys would join in, representing other members of the Dixmore Five. The state agreed to conduct further DNA testing. The attorneys then contacted the Dixmore police and were told that the DNA sample from Catrice's body could not be located. However, several months later, they did find the sample and it was sent in for further testing. In 2010, Kino Barnes was interviewed by the lawyers working together now for the Dixmore Five. He signed a written statement saying he never told police that Jonathan Barr had any information about Catrice's case. He claims the police report was completely and entirely falsified. In March of 2011, DNA testing would conclude that the person who sexually assaulted Catrice was a 34-year-old man named Willie Randolph. He's a convicted rapist who also spent time in prison for armed robbery, gun, and drug charges. At that time, Willie had already been arrested 39 times, and he was also paroled near Catrice's grandmother's home prior to her abduction and murder. In November of 2011, 20 years to the month after Catrice's murder, the convictions of the Dixmore Five were vacated and they were released and issued certificates of innocence, restoring their full rights as U.S. citizens. However, Teresa, Catrice's mother, was also there when the Dixmore Five were released. And now she has to go through life wondering if justice will be served to the right person or persons and Will she have to sit through another entire trial? Quote, that was hard to sit through. Now I have to do it all over again, right from the beginning. I'm going to continue to fight for my child. She was my world. She was my everything. Now I have to be her voice, she told the Chicago Tribune. However, no charges were immediately filed against Willie Randolph. Teresa voiced her confusion at the state attorney's unwillingness to press charges. I kept meeting with them and meeting with them, and they said they were investigating. They said, we don't have enough evidence. And I said, what more do you need? You have the DNA. It just didn't make any sense. In 2014, a new police chief, Ron Berg, was taking office and kept hearing about this case from residents. He coordinated with the sheriff's department and a headline in the Chicago Tribune would say it all. Officials reopening botched Dixmore 5 case. At a press conference, officials seemed very aware of the mistakes the previous investigators made and didn't want to focus solely on the DNA result. We have that information, but frankly, in any investigation, you have to keep your eyes wide open. We don't want to have tunnel vision. We want to make sure that everybody is interviewed, stated Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart. This is about a 14-year-old girl who was murdered, Police Chief Ron Berg said. People were exonerated, and nobody has been charged. This is about getting a person who did what they did and having those people charged. We want justice for Catrice Matthews. That year, the Dixmore Five would reach a wrongful conviction settlement with the state of Illinois for $40 million, the largest settlement of that kind in the history of the state. The men, however, continue to struggle with various trust and anger issues. Some of them lost family while they were falsely imprisoned, but they all lost their innocence and so many important years, years that could have helped them find and lead very different lives. My life is still messed up. You can't erase all that time I did. We were just kids, Robert Taylor said. Sometime later, Willie Randolph was bragging about the crime in prison serving time for a drug charge, but he didn't know that that conversation was being recorded. With the DNA results and a new confession in hand, prosecutors were finally able to move forward. Randolph was charged with murder in September of 2016 and denied bail. I haven't been able to find any further updates on the case from them, but considering the evidence and his history, I expect that that trial will conclude with a suitable verdict and that Willie Randolph will be in jail for a very long time. My heart just breaks for Teresa, who's going to go through this all again. Uh, I've literally seen quotes from her. She plans on sitting at every single court date that happens with Willie Randolph. The city of Chicago is known as the false confession capital of the United States. They have twice as many documented false confessions as any other city in the country. 
According to 60 Minutes, the Justice Department is now investigating the interrogation practices used in Chicago. Case cracked. Really tough case. And thank you to the brain scratcher that sent that recommendation in. I think there was a few of you actually. Um, I wish that I had better information about where this has gone. I was very surprised to see that the last of the news articles, they just stop at September 1st, 2016 with him being charged. Uh, I even tried to look into finding the court records. I couldn't find anything available online in particular for the criminal records in that county. Uh, Because I just wanted to see, do they have a court date set? Are they just fighting back and forth in pre-trial stuff right now? Or has the trial date been set, but it's so far out that we just haven't gotten to it yet? Uh, Considering how much press there is around this case, uh, I'm relatively certain that articles will hit when uh, the trial does eventually start. And talking about him confessing on tape... Uh, And in that type of situation, much different than these false confession scenarios where we're talking about teenage men, you know, um, being interrogated or interviewed, depending on how you want to phrase it, by police officers being told that, you know, you're going to spend time in jail, you're going to be charged with this and that. We're talking about Willie talking to uh, essentially another person that he's in prison with. So Interestingly, we have seen cases where those types of confessions in jail uh, turn out to be false, but when you're coupling that tape up with the DNA evidence, which they actually verified, they went and they got another swab from Willie in particular, just to make sure that that match was 100%, it is, uh, I think it's going to be very hard for this case to go any other direction than with a guilty verdict. But if something weird like that does happen around this, I'll be sure to keep you all updated here on the channel. And if you want to learn more about false confessions, be sure to check out the video I did in place of Case Cracked last week. Uh, It is called False Confessions and Brendan Dassey. I went and spent some time listening to Brendan Dassey's attorneys talk about this um, and give their insights. And I've shared that with you guys in that video. So a lot more that could be considered around false confessions. Um, it's something that really troubles me when we bump into it in a case. And I'm hopeful that as a country, we start making some changes around that. So if you want to learn more about how you can help with that, check out that last video, False Confessions and Brendan Dassey. Thank you so much for joining me here on Case Cracked. I really appreciate you guys spending your time with me. Come back on Wednesday when we will look into a brand new missing persons case on Searchlight. Take care.